Um, the, last, uh, the last lecture is going to be about uh, transitional disks and second generation formation. Uh, call them like second generation is a convention because uh, you can you will see that we have uh, we can have formation that is happening during different phases of the of the binary evolution so we could have a second a third and a hybrid generation as well seriously <laughs> all right really hot. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> right. So, no. No. Ah, all right. Um... Okay, as you might have understood, it's always a game of uh, an like a game of um, yay, thank you. It's always a game of uh, um, interplay between theory and data observations, right? So usually, how it works is that there's someone that is uh, um, developing a theory, say like, oh, this could happen, and then you have all of a set of observers there, just gonna go, okay, let's go and check if this is real or not. Back in, uh, uh, not, not, not that long ago actually, uh, 2011, Kashi and, and Soccer, they theorized that uh, during the binary evolution, uh, a close binary evolution for such, uh, you have uh, the, all of the different channels of common envelope uh, and the things that we saw during the first class. Um, when it's ejecting the common envelope uh, atmospheres, you have a part of uh, of this uh, of this um, stellar ejector that is gonna stay attached to the star, to the binary, to the inner binary. So, um, sorry. Um, yeah, exactly. So they theorize that between one and ten percent of the material of the of the envelope during this evolution is not going to reach the escape velocity for such is going to stay attached to the binary and it's going to form a disk because of the angular momentum. Um, yes, indeed. So the angular, the angular momentum is originally coming from the orbital angular momentum of the companion. Uh, but even if the angular momentum is not efficient and sufficient to form a disk, the interaction between the gas and the binary system will make it that uh, as you binary, this will appear around the binary. Um, so they theorize that there is a formation of circumbinary disk around post-AGB binary stars with more or less an orbital separation of one AU. Um, of course, this is like uh, one of the work that is coming out of uh, other uh, analysis that were made uh, previously. Um, what is very important is that one thing is that you leave the binary evolving itself alone, separated by anything else, uh, and it's going to evolve in one specific way. But in the moment you put a disk around the binary, of course, you're going to like uh, create a, an extra, there, there will be an extra force that is changing the, the evolution of your own binary. And this is seen as in uh, a changes in the orbital separation of the binary, of the inner binary. So in the moment that a disk appears, it will interact with the binary and the, and the evolution, and it will change uh, the architecture of the inner binary. Okay, so um, with the presence of a disk, there's uh, the idea, like as we know from pre-main sequence uh, uh, planetary formation, that indeed you can form exoplanets, but why do we, how do they form? And why do we think there are exoplanets forming after? That's the observational part, right? 
Well, I mean, if you observe all of the different uh, type of disk with the different instruments, you might have your Alma, Sphere, Sphere again, and, and VLTI. You see that there are structures. So here you have like uh, uh, rings of uh, gaps, exactly, yeah, rings and gaps. And here you have these like uh, uh, spiral structures. Or uh, sometimes you find like a, a big, here you can see that there's a binary in the middle. Uh, you can find a big cavity in the middle and then a structure on the outside or as well like uh, asymmetries. So why asymmetries were not, well, of course it depends by the, um, the inclination of the system towards the observer direction. You might have, uh, uh, like with galaxies, the same thing. Like you might see uh, different kind of structures. Uh, but yeah, sometimes they are pretty quite uh, um, weird, right? You, you don't expect to see something like that. Um, okay. Are these disks visible, observable? Yeah, I'll just show you pictures, so of course they are. <laughs> but let me go back just a second also to another um, Another discovery that like, uh, like sent scientists a bit in crisis because uh, at some point they found this system that is like the NN Serpentis system. Um, it has uh, two giant exoplanets, um, pretty much uh, um, wide separation, I would say. This is like a Jupiter separation because it's 5.4 if, if I recall correctly where you have uh, a system of a white dwarf and an M dwarf. It means that uh, the binary went through the first common envelope phase, or stable mass transfer, we don't really know. Um, and then detected through um, eclipse um, transit time variation, which means that uh, basically they saw that there was a, a, a slightly offset between uh, the the between the transit of the, of, the, of the stars and the planets, so they said, then, and the stars, sorry. Um, so by measuring this uh, for a long time, they said, like, oh, there's a tiny offset, meaning that there is another third body that is like uh, changing the center of mass of my, of my binary, and so I have a slightly offset of, uh, of the time of the, of the um, occultation between the stars, right? So this is what you see here. Um, this was... Uh, the number of epochs that it was observed. It has been observed for a long time. Um, this is uh, the residuals between, uh, um, well, you have the model and then the different observation. Um, and so they found this system, right, with two, with two giant planets. But it's so weird, because like, this system is not supposed to exist. Like, they did studies with, like, about the, the stability of the system, and they don't understand how it's there, because of course, like, uh, the, you can measure the white dwarf by, measure, by observing a white dwarf. You know how old is the system, and the system is like one mega year old, and you're like, uh, th these planets shouldn't be in this specific location if they survive the evolution. They should be in a completely other like, uh, zone of the parameter space. So they were like, hmm, what's happening? <laughs> and that was the first uh, hint that maybe these planets were just formed in, uh, in a disk uh, on the post-AGB circumbinary disk. But again, it's one million years, like, it's too fast. We know that like, planetary formation is much, well, it's not much, but it's, like, it's definitely slower than one, one, million, one mega year, right? So the detection of the system like, sent everyone to crisis, and then you have people that are telling you, still now, eh, they, this planet do not exist, that is uh, caused by uh, an effect of, uh, could be magnetic uh, effect that is making that the occultation of the binary uh, is not happening at the right time, and that is called the Applegate mechanism. Um, so there's a still discussion, and the, this is not even the, the, the most recent paper. Like The most recent one is 2023, <laughs> where they observed again, they added a new epoch to the system, and again, they cannot like, really pin down uh, the evolution if it's with planets or not. 
So basically, the new points are just following in here, but there are still a lot of models that are passing through, so it's not confirming that it's like literally just a, a real planetary system. I, I think it's real, but you know, like, uh, there is an uncertainty which is, uh, we need to take into account. So, we detect this and we're like, oh my god, maybe it's a new planet formation. What do we do? Um, right. So we call it post-AGB formation because, or post-AGB um, disks, because if you recall, right. So if you recall, there is uh, between uh, the asymptotic giant branch, which is the AGB, and before the planetary nebula, um, well, this is like the HR diagram, just in a very simplified way, right? Um, you might have that, like, you have the disk forms in here, uh, but of course you have high luminosity objects. Um, so what scientists are doing is just observing all of the disks that are forming just after the binary, the first, uh, the most massive star evolved. Uh, just remember that like for this phase, we only have uh, low intermediate mass that is uh, going through that phase. So between 0 0.6 solar mass and 8 solar masses. Um, so we detect, uh, um, we detect this around the post-AGB binaries. Um, yeah. Okay. So indeed, uh, um, that's what I just mentioned before at the very beginning, that you have indeed the formation of a disk uh, theorized by Kashi and Kos and Kosher for the last, uh, the last paper. Um, but of course, it's not the only moment where you can have uh, you can have um, formation of exoplanets. Okay, so um, I will show you a specific work that has been done uh, on uh, post-AGB disks by a colleague of mine, which is uh, Jacques Kluska, and uh, his PhD students. They did. Uh, they collected uh, a sample of 85 post-AGB. They observed uh, 85 post-AGB, and that's the largest sample that was collected up till now um, within the Milky Way, and also 200 in the Large Magellanic Clouds and the Small Magellanic Clouds. Um, so what they did it was trying to collect it and see if there was uh, some correlation, or trying to understand the origins of this uh, this new structure for uh, post-AGB disks. Um, this is just an example by the scene at all 2020 of uh, different uh, shapes that you might have. So you see, um, this is obviously all due to the evolution of the star and the type of uh, common envelope ejecta uh, that you could have. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. <laughs> Do you see any difference in here? apart from what is written on the slide, of course. So do you know what this is? We have, well, um, spectral energy distribution. Sorry. Okay. So we have two spectral energy distribution that are the black curve. Uh, of course, you have the model, and then you have your tiny any little data point. And then you have uh, something that is happening in the, in, the, in the infrared, right? But what's the difference between these two? Do you think it's the same object? Or do you think it's different object? So, Naively, one would say, like, yeah, it's just the same. Well, I mean, it's the same type of uh, of object, but like, obviously, it has a different behavior. So, it could be um, two binaries, uh, one with something else happening, and well, some, something A happening and something B happening, right? But indeed, it's not. This one is a single star, and this one is a binary. Um, how do we know that? So. As I mentioned, the first um, one of the day, um, you know that the peak of, uh, these are high luminosity objects, right? The main, uh, the one that just evolved is very high luminosity. 
So you have that the peak of, uh, of the spectral energy distribution is either or in the in UV or in the visible, right? So you might think that it's this one, okay? Or also this one. But then like we see another structure. Do you remember when I told you uh, when you need to observe something that is cooler, at which, which frequency do you go? Yeah, exactly, in the infrared. Because like, uh, to observe something that is like hot, you go towards the blue part. So you go to Chandra, you go to high energy radiation. But if you need to observe a planet, you go in the near infrared. If you need to observe a disk, you go in the middle infrared. So you go towards like, uh, if you need to observe something that is even cooler, you go to radio. So that's why we have SKA, SK, SKA, sorry. Um, but yeah, the, the difference in here is that this is a single star. And what we are observing indeed is like, uh, it's still evolving. So you, here we have the core and here you have uh, basically the shell of the star that is just like uh, expanding, but it's still not really detached. So it's expanding and it's cooler because it's far away from the center. So you clearly see this contrast for which here you have a decrease of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the flux. And then you have a peak later on, which is uh, the temperature that will tell you the temperature of the cold shell on the outside. So if you had to just fit this curve with another spectral energy distribution, the temperature of that black body will tell you, well, like the, when you fit it, you will, you will know the temperature of the shell, of the outer shell. Uh, and in this case here, what we have is indeed like a binary uh, with uh, the presence of a disk. This, is called, this effect in here, both here and here, is called uh, infrared excess. So in the moment that we detect an infrared excess to something that we thought um, it was uh, just uh, one single object, one point source object or a binary, then we know that we have to dig further and try to understand what's happening. Mine at the beginning was a very tricky question because you really couldn't know that one was a single star and the other was a binary, right? It was just a, um, a thing to make you think a bit and trying to understand whether, like, uh, how would you approach the, the problem? Okay, so, like, I have uh, one curve, two curves, so what do we do? We fit the first one, and then, like, we try to do a combination of stuff and trying to understand which kind of object we are observing, because perhaps sometimes you don't know it from, from the beginning. Sometimes you think that you're observing a single star, and then it ends up being a binary. Um, okay, so, when we observe, uh, um, a disk, uh, we always see it by photometry. So all of these points are taken at different, uh, um, um, at, at different frequencies, at different uh, um, wavelengths, yeah. Okay. Another interesting thing that they found uh, uh, for post-GV binaries is that uh, um, they, they display uh, like a peculiar chemical property. And uh, they saw a uh, depletion of uh, refractory elements. So um, the definition of refractory elements are those elements that solidify at higher temperatures. So in this case, it will be uh, more or less around here. This is uh, um, the element over, over hydrogen and normalized to the sun. And what they found, basically, um, all of the refractory, they are depleted, right? So all of the, all of the higher metals, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's less than what it was expected for a solar distribution, solar, for a solar composition, right? Um, this is a function of the condensation uh, temperature. So usually what we do is like to, to, to know the, um, the metallicity of the star, we do iron over, over hydrogen because it's uh, the most easy refractory elements that we can measure in, uh, in stellar atmospheres. Uh, but sometimes like you can also try zinc over, over TI and stuff like that. But the easiest one is iron, of course. So they, they found... Um, 
Well, that was like already, f like, th there were already some detection of depletion of, uh, of refractory material for post-AGB. But later on, it was confirmed again by the, the, the collection of, uh, of these 85 uh, stars in the galaxy. And I will tell you later why this is important, but just keep this in mind. Okay, so um, what are the properties of disks around the post-AGB binaries? We have uh, uh, that, of course, it's, uh, it's a formation of a disk after the ejection of a stellar atmosphere. Um, automatically, we have an inner binary. The, we have high luminosity of the central star because I told you it's going up to could be 30,000 Kelvin. Um, there is accretion and outflows because it's not like a steady system. Of course, like the inner part of the disk will interact with the binary inside. Um, and they are isolated in the sense that it's not a crowded field of binaries, because if it was a crowded field, you will have the other stars interacting with your system. Um, what are the disk properties? Um, you can detect the disk in the infrared excess. Um, it's a, a stable disk. We have a Keplerian rotation. Usually the disk mass is around uh, 0 0.001 solar masses. Uh, there's dust grow, of course, within the disk, and uh, the lifetime is very short compared to uh, premier sequence uh, mm, disks. Also because you have to think that th there's a, um, a really bright object in the middle, so it's gonna cause photo evaporation of the disk and the, the disk lifetime is gonna be shorter. Um, right. But <laughs> why do we care, indeed? Um, so, you saw that binary evolution is a bit complicated, right? So, um, and we know that you have this binary uh, interaction that will cause the differences in the orbital, the differences uh, in the, will cause the orbit of the inner binary to change. Um, so, here we have, uh, uh, the number of, of systems, uh, like uh, the separation of, uh, of, the, of the inner binary, if it goes through common envelope. And then uh, here it's a standard model if uh, we have just wind interaction. But the fun key thing is that uh, um, the observed periods of, the, of this kind of post-AGB stars are <laughs> exactly in the middle between the common envelope one and uh, the theoretical, uh, the standard model. Yay! It's exciting, right? <laughs> it's like, what the, what the heck is happening? <laughs> so there's something going on that we are not accounting for in uh, in the in the common envelope evolution or in the standard uh, in the standard model. Um, it could be the presence of uh, of a planet. It could be. <laughs> a lot of gravitational wave happening and uh, at some point during the common envelope that is like shrinking the orbit in a, in a very um, drastic way. We don't know. But let's uh, carry on with this, right? So, um, yeah, this is exactly what I already mentioned. So, we need to observe this kind of disk to understand what's going on, already knowing that the, 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 the binary separation that is so different from what is theorized, it's already a hint of something happening. Okay, so more in detail, we have uh, in a post-AGB binary system, we have, uh, uh, of course, more or less to scale um, that uh, the binary separation is one AU, um, then we have an inner disk that is more or less 10 AU, and then the total extension of the disk will be 100 AU. AU. Yep. Oh, no. Espera, espera, espera. Uh, do the two models that fail to explain the observations, do they account for the... Um, Binary disk interaction? Those ones in the plot? No. But I think there are people like um, 
trying to, 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 to work on that. Um, I don't have a, a reference, but it's known, uh, it's, it's tricky, right? Because it's something that happened very recently. This, uh, this catalog was released literally two years ago, right? So if something, um, if someone is looking at this, I still don't know. But it's very likely that this is happening. But I mean, from what you said, this may be one possibility of why the models, the models are wrong in this case. Yeah. For not accounting for this. Yeah. Um, actually, what I wanted to do is, um, so we have uh, the, the binary evolution model, which is uh, um, the one that we use for the long-term evolution for uh, the planets. And uh, the idea of uh, a next uh, master or PhD project would be indeed to include the, the formation of a disk within the code and to run it and try to see what's the difference, but just but not for one system, for a whole population of, uh, of systems, like uh, the LISA population, for example. Um, okay. So how do we observe a disk? <laughs> As I said before, like you, you really need to go through um, photometry, right? But uh, here you have a system, you don't have a disk. So like uh, you, you need to observe the system. So if you want to observe the stars, you go in the, which band? Come on. It's high luminosity. So it will be in the, I can't hear you guys. No, in serio, no, no intendo. No, high luminosity. Yes, high luminosity is UV. Okay, luminosity. Okay, let me go in the side. High luminosity, you observe in the UV. Like um, solar type uh, temperature, you go to the visible. Then you go to planets. Then you go to dust. <laughs> and, and you carry on like, the cooler, the redder, okay? So if I have to observe just the stars, I'm gonna go back here. If I have to observe just the stars, it will be, depending on what we expect, either UV or visible, right? But then if I have to observe all, o all of the rest, so um, the, the inner part, I observe it with the, with in the near infrared. So in the near infrared is this band, and then like, let's assume that it's like ta ta ta, you get all of that points, right? It depends how is your, your instrument. You might have just one band, so you will have just one point. You might have uh, a spectrophotometer for which you can have different points even in the same band. Then you want to expand a bit, but then of course we are going further away from the, from the inner star, which is hot, meaning that our material, our dust is getting cooler. So I go to the, to the right, exactly. <laughs> and then I observe in the mid infrared. And in this case, the observation was not, were done. This is valid for all the 85 stars, the uh, post AGB uh, system that you observed. Um, VLT with the, the use Matisse. And then you can observe more or less around uh, in, the, in the scale of 10 AU. And then you go to ALMA, because ALMA is the one that is uh, observing in the submillimeter. And in that case, you get to get to all of the, all of the dust. Uh, this was ALMA here, and also sphere in scattered light. So both of the, both of the observations. And then you go and cover all of the, of the coolest parts right here. So by doing this, we can literally map this infrared excess. So in the moment that you know that if this is just the binary, you will just see points that are fitting this model, this curve, right? Uh, can you compare directly because there are like four or three instruments, different instruments, so can you compare directly or do you need to No, you need something? to calibrate it. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. no, th this is an, an easiest representation, but of course you need to calibrate it like uh, uh, they have absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I wish we could combine them normally. <laughs> that would be so nice. But no, no, you, you, you need to know where is the zero, the zero point to, to put them together. Um, yeah, that happens with all of the instruments. For instance, that's why one of the reasons in JWST they had an overlap between instruments. So the, the wavelength range, there is a tiny overlap. So you could uh, indeed like, combine everything together in an easier way than not having an overlap. Um, okay, so from here they observe and they say like, hmm, there is a specific class of disk that is uh, that we are observing, and it could be it, it is the transition disk. So the transition disk is like um, a disk with a large, large cavity. Um, they were first discovered around young stars, and the cause could be indeed uh, photo evaporation because the star is very hot at the beginning, and then it's evaporating the inner part of the disk. Or you could also have uh, disk-planet interaction. Um, that is causing this, uh, this, uh, this cavity. So, they took uh, observation for all of these uh, all of the systems. So you see here the collection of uh, the different data points. Uh, well, this is for just the AC uh, hair, uh, which is one one disk with large cavity. And then you see that you collect uh, different data points from the different instrument, and you clearly see that there is a um, a structure in here, right? But um, this could uh, remind you of. Uh, this, right? Look at this, and then I'm gonna go back to the other one. Mm. So, it's kind of tricky, right? But like they knew that this was like uh, indeed uh, a binary, so they had, they knew that a priori that it was a binary, so they knew that uh, um, this was not the shell, but it was indeed uh, like uh, the, f the shape of the disk. So it's a transition disk with a large cavity in the middle. It means that the cavity is not emitting anything. In, uh, there's no dust. There's no material. So we don't see it. And for such, we have a decrease in the, in the flux. But then going towards the red, we go towards a um, cooler object, cooler material, cooler dust, which is there. And then like, whoop, we have another peak. So they did this study, and they realized that if I have uh, the radio sublimation here, because radio sublimation is given by the temperature of the star, of course, you can, you can tell at which distance you have the radio sublimation. And then they realized that systematically, the inner radius they were detecting, such as the, the um, the dust, the, the initial, where, where the dust was beginning in the, in the radius, it was much larger than the radio sublimation, which is weird, because like, there's something here happening, why do I have this? It shouldn't be happening, because I would have, ideally, if it's going every, everything in, like it should be, my dust should start here, because that's the dust sublimation where the dust should start. But no, the dust systematically was starting like, uh, at uh, what we defined the inner radius, in a moment that it was uh, in, a, in a location that it was much larger than the radius sublimation of the dust. Hmm. So, um, yeah, and here you can see that there was a peak of like, uh, the, um, mm, well, these values, of course, are specific for this system, right? But the global uh, observation are valid for all of the other, most of the other, of the other system. Um, so yeah, this is just the shape of, uh, of uh, the peak of the mass, of the dust. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, they realize in their observation that there are two types of disk. Again, confirming uh, um, what it was observed before, but for a large sample. We have a full disk, where indeed uh, the, Inner radius is coinciding. It's like uh, coinciding, yeah. Um, it's equivalent to the dust sublimation radius. So like this. So you have uh, a normal shape here of the uh, infrared excess, and then you have uh, the transition disk, for which you have you this large cavity, which is causing. So 
Okay, um, here what I'm doing is observing from the center towards the outside, right? So um, here you have the peak, here you have the empty part. Of course, it's not completely f down because you have contamination from the other, like, uh, the other uh, element. And then again, like this part will be again the, the infrared excess of the, of the peak of, uh, of, of the dust and the, 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 the disk. So again, uh, what we do, we observe in the, in the um, near infrared. And then um, we observe in the mid infrared. Um, which you did, okay, fine, I, you already mentioned everything, okay. Um, so in the moment I see a cavity, I see a decrease of the flux, what's it? What is it? It's a transitional disk because there is a cavity, okay? Okay, so they collected all of this data and they found out that basically the, um, okay, they took the color, do you know what is a color? So it's a difference between the magnitude or in two different bands, right? So I took uh, the value, the mean value for the near infrared, I took the mean, mean value for the mid infrared, I subtract one from the other and that's called a color. So they measured the color of all of these, uh, all of these disks and they found out that there is indeed a structure. So the majority of the full disks, they are here in the center but then the transitional disk, they are like uh, all of these, uh, um, well, you have data points and, and uh, simulation, right? And all of these like, that are behaving in this way. So the, the blue ones are the simulation for the transitional disk, and then you have the, the data points. Mm. Can we go back here? Yeah. In two slides, please. Sorry, I have an issue. Maybe it's a naive question. Uh, why, what is the, the red line in both cases? The red line? Yeah, the red line that uh, it looks like a, a black body spectrum. Yeah, so it's a model for the uh, hotter element of the binary. Ah, okay. So uh, how, can, how can you differentiate if there is a disk or not? I didn't get it. Okay. So if it was just the binary, mm -hmm. You will have, uh, if you were to observe in the middle infrared, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have these points here. You would have them on the on the curve. For for a, for a usual uh, binary. If it was just like a, a single star. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in this case, obviously, you're observing the hotter component, meaning that you can disregard the second one because it's cool compared to the first one. Uh -huh. So if these points, they will not be so high. They will be on the curve. Because mm -hmm. it will match the model of, uh, of your own star, just a star. Yeah. Um, the same one, like, for all of the other points. All of this, they should be on the curve. Mm -hmm. But it's much more larger. So, you know, for example, for, uh, for this frequency, if I were to get a, a photometric point at 10 to the minus, I don't know, 5 to 10 to the minus 15, I will be like, oh, I'm observing the star. Mm -hmm. But there's this difference, because like, I, I can see when I'm observing in, in this frequency, like uh, I have a point up here. Yeah, yeah, you have more lumin luminosity, right? Mm? More light, you have more light co come yes. to you. Okay. And you have an excess. It's and good. Yeah. Uh, w can you repeat again, why do, uh, do we have two peaks in the, the, the right side? Yes. Is so due to what? Um, what happened? Okay. Basically, um, right. So again, if I just observe the star, disregard the, like, forget about the disk. If I mm -hmm. observe just the star, it will be the red curve, okay? Yeah. But then, uh, okay, I, I collect my data points, pop, 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 I'm going from the, from the visible to the, to the I'm, I'm going to the infra near infrared, and I still see that they are matching here, right? Okay. And then at some point I have a decrease and I was thinking like, okay, fine, that's everything, okay. It's following the model of my star, so I just have a star. Mm -hmm. But then I, I, I can see that my data points are, are, are going up again. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So this difference between the peak of here, the two peaks, and, and this point, it's uh, the, this cavity. Basically, I don't have any material, I don't have any dust that is giving me information, because there's nothing there. Okay. So by having nothing, I don't have radiation, and meaning that like I don't have flux, I don't have light that is coming from that part. Mm -hmm. uh, but then like, I have again something, I have again a dust, mm -hmm. that, a disk that is uh, cold because it's far away from the star. So it's like the, this temperature, it's, uh, it's uh, lower than, okay. Like the outer temperature of a disk, it will be of course lower than the inner temperature of a disk. I see. Right? So I can see again that there's material, there's radiation that is coming towards me, and I can detect it like by taking more, more, more data points toward the middle, uh, like in, well, in the mid infrared, it's here, but if we go towards uh, larger frequencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that clear it. now? Yeah. yeah. No, uh, no, no. Yeah. Uh, what's the effect of uh, disk radiation uh, by the binary, uh, how the light is uh, reprocessed, and you can see uh, the reprocessed light in uh, this spectrum? What do you mean reprocessed? Because the, the, the inner binary uh, irradiates the disk, because yeah. the disk is warped. Yeah. Uh, how does light is reprocessed? And, uh, so you, you cannot uh, observe that, because you observe it's uh, the disk in the moment you're observing it. So um, for you to detect uh, for evaporation of the disk, th this is what, Maybe yeah, for the example, evaporation, I agree. It's, uh, it's really, mm, it's, it's not possible. What you do is like, uh, you know the temperature of the stars, so you have the model of your star and how hot it can be, and then you combine it with the, the model of your disk, and then you say like, okay, for this temperature, you will have that amount of radiation, and I expect that uh, the, 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 the radiation of the star is gonna evaporate my disk uh, uh, with this uh, inner, like in a specific way, and then you do models for that. But when you observe it, it's kind of tricky. Okay, and uh, uh, the inner uh, disk uh, truncation can happen by magnetic fields of the binary. I, I, I'm <laughs> I asking because uh, some cataclysmic variable have a uh, high magnetic fields, the disk uh, can reach the, the yeah, no, white you're dwarf. Right. Um, it could be, yes. Okay. Yeah, it could be. Uh, usually, it's a combination of stuff. Like, it's always depend by, by, by the type of uh, the inner binary. Of course, if it's a very strong, uh, uh, strong magnetic field, sometimes you might have that the disk is also like uh, going along the, the shape of the magnetic field. But um, in this case, it's mostly due to the sublimation radius for which. Uh, uh, you don't have uh, inner presence of dust, uh, like so close to the star, because everything is evapor it's, it's in gas status. So to detect it, you need to go to dust, meaning that you have to go to have a, a sublimation, and uh, they have to be solid, let's say. Oh. So the inner disk is defined just by the sublimation radius that is given by the temperature of, uh, of, the, of the inner binary. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that one we started, okay. So, um, remember at the beginning, I so said, like, keep in mind, like, uh, that uh, in uh, post GB binaries, we found, uh, um, <laughs> we found a depletion of uh, refractory elements on the surface of the, uh, of the binary, right? Um, so, by observing this, uh, these disks, they found uh, that, uh, in the case of full disk, the metallicity of the star was this one. And uh, in the case of transition disk, the metallicity of the star was this one, right? So there's a clearly a shift. There is a, a clearly a, a correlation between uh, the binary having uh, 
a transitional disk and the composition of the of the binary and the full disk and the composition the well the, the refractory comp uh, composition of um, of the atmosphere of the others um, so basically what is like finding this uh, this uh, this correlation like uh, Therefore, there must be a mechanism that efficiently separates the refractory elements, the dust and the volatile, while creating the cavity of, uh, of the disk. Um, basically, what's happening? <laughs> One of the interpretation is that there is a planet in the disk that we are not able to detect, um, that possibly is forming or was already there, that's, uh, that's unclear, but there's a surely like uh, um, a big hint of uh, a, a planet in the disk, because um, basically the planet is uh, disturbing the disk, and uh, what it's doing is just basically putting a barrier to the trapped dust. So we have uh, in the inner cavity, this is the inner cavity, which is just gas. So we cannot see gas, uh, and that's why we detect uh, um, a decrease in the flux, as I, uh, in the image before. So basically, there is uh, the planet that is just like trapping the dust, trapping the refractory in the outer, in the outer disk. And uh, for such this dust, the refractory is not able to get to this area and then accrete on the on the star, so it's not accreting on the star. So I mean that if I observe the star and I don't see the metals in here, I have a very low metallicity. So for they did like uh, in the whole sample, you had the model normally like with the um, with the dust that is like getting until like a full disk model where it's getting until here, and then you have that gas and, uh, uh, and dust is accreting on the star, but in the f so when, when metal are accreting on the stars, then you have that the, the metallicity is like higher than in the transitional disk case. Is that clear? Do you have, ciao Filippo. Do you have any question on this? Okay. Um, right, see. So this was an uh, uh, observation of post-AGB disks, uh, which, is, uh, which is telling us that there is surely very high probability of a planet to be part of this, uh, 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 being the cause of this uh, transitional disk with these large cavities. But we don't know, <laughs> probably we will never know for a long time, if it's a first generation planet that survived the evolution, or if it's a second generation planet, meaning that it was formed from the circumbinary disk that the, the binary formed after the, the first common envelope evolution. evolution. So we might have various generation of planets. Uh, the first generation one, that is the one that uh, Vladimir talked to you about in the first week. But then we might have a second generation, which is in the post-AGB phase. That's the thing that we just, uh, we just uh, um, discussed. But then we might have a third generation when uh, we have uh, the second common envelope for which, again, the, sec the least massive star is evolving. And then uh, it's like it's, there's a second common envelope phase and then there's a second common envelope ejecta. And then part of the material is going to stay bound to the binary. It's going to form a disk because of the angular momentum. And from that disk, you might have a formation of another planet. <laughs> Just to complicate things, we also have the ivory generation too, uh, which could be first generation planets that survive. Could be first generation whole planet or first generation destroyed planet. We'll, we'll, we'll see that uh, in a moment that find themselves in a second generation disk, and then they start accreting on that second generation disk. So you might have a, an inner core that is first generation, and an outer core, an outer envelope that is second generation. 
Okay, more into the tail. I can't see. Okay, so if uh, we if uh, I have an evolution, my planet is like more or less destroyed, but I still have a ti teeny tiny planetesimal that is like just hanging around because we detected planet planetesimal orbiting um, white dwarf. We have a detection, so we know that we have them. But it can act as a seed uh, in a second generation disk, and of course this is gonna grow much more quicker than if there, the seed was like very teeny tiny. If I have a seed that is big, it's gonna grow quicker. <laughs> and then we carry on, on we, we go back to our NN Serpentis that was formed in, uh, in uh, one million, e one, one mega year. And it's like, oh, maybe I understand, maybe it's actually a, like a second generation one, because it, it grew on a seed that was larger. Um, yeah, that's the same thing. Um, the other funky thing is uh, like, of course, you might have a misalignment because of the evolution we saw that the orbit of the planet is changing compared to the, to the, to the main sequence one. But then you have a new formation of a disk, so you have a misalignment of, uh, for example, a planet that is going in polar orbit and then a disk that is like uh, um, coplanar with the, the orbit of the binary. And so you have uh, something that is going like this and then a, pl and a, and, and a disk like this. So there will be an interaction between the orbit of the planet that is gonna create a uh, um, unique disk planet configuration. Obviously I'm talking just about one planet or one debris, but it could be many more, you know. It can be a multi-planetary system. Um, again, first generation planet can become much more massive because they can accrete on the, on the material of the disk. But in that case, uh, it will become a brown dwarf, you know, because if you accrete over the deuterium burning limit, then you become a, br a brown dwarf. This is 13, I don't know why I put 14, but anyway. Um, right, and then you might have, again, a first generation planet, and is, which is interacting with the second generation planet that is forming in the disk. So in that case, we'll cause instability because of course everyone was happy in their own orbit before and then like they have all of a sudden combined them together and uh, you can have inward migration and uh, um, collision with the stars or ejection of, uh, of the planets. Yeah, so I already mentioned this. So the interesting thing is like if truly this is a second generation system, um, it's, uh, and, and it was formed so quickly it's very nice, it, it will be very important to compare it with the first generation formation um, because you can study the difference between the, the formation processes in the pre-main sequence and in the post-main sequence. And also study the level of migration that could happen within the disk. Well, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit redundant, but like at least you can uh, you can uh, uh, get uh, to the point. Um, by existing, of course, like scientists say, okay, let's do some models to see if actually we can explain uh, the, the why these planets are so close by when it should be in, in not stable region and, uh, and if we can explain and find out uh, uh, and match the observation, right? So that was uh, a work done by Schleicher and, 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 and Dreisler in 2014. Uh, and they found indeed that uh, at the also on a theoretical level, and then Serpentis could be represented by, mm, it could be formed as a second generation disk. Um, from a second generation disk, sorry. Um, but again, like, uh, we have uh, a second common envelope happening. Uh, the same is going to happen for NN Serpentis when uh, um, the, this main uh, M dwarfs is going to evolve and we're going to have a second uh, uh, common envelope. Um, and we, it's called like second generation. So we can have uh, uh, formation also there, but the disk and the disk composition it will be obviously different from, uh, from the second generation disk and the first generation disk because you have uh, a chemical enrichment for the star when it's evolving and uh, you also need to account that maybe the star has received, uh, has collided with the uh, rocky planets and contaminated the atmosphere 
um, for such, the, the disk is going to be richer. If the disk is richer in metal, then uh, the formation of my planets is going to be easier, especially for giant planets, because the higher the metallicity, we saw that there's a correlation with the, with the presence of a giant exoplanet. Um, but then again, we have the hybrid, for example. We will not be able to distinguish uh, uh, whether it, the, the planet is first generation, second generation, or third generation, and so on, unless we do it through spectroscopy. Um, and study, indeed, the planetary chemistry, <laughs> which, if it doesn't transit, is quite tricky. And it could be maybe done by direct imaging, but it has to be on a wide orbit, so it, it's tricky. Um, yet, by the system architecture, so knowing uh, how far are the planets, the separation of the binary, and so on, you might have, indeed, a hint of uh, what's happening, especially if you do, uh, like, a population studies. Um, okay, so we tried to check on this on the third generation uh, on the third generation um, system um, with uh, that was a work of a, of a master's student. Um, basically, you do analytical tracks. Um, did Vladimir cover this on the on his course the first week? So it's basically what you do is. Uh, it's a pebble accretion, so you put a seed uh, in, the, in the disk and then uh, you evolve it and try to see how it accretes. So what you, what you do, <coughs> you put your seeds at different distances from uh, your, your inner binary and then you see how it's accreting. So you have, uh, again, like sublimation region, the condensation line uh, and the condensation region. So we did this work for... Um, Four double white dwarfs, two of them, uh, they are belonging to the, um, the Lisa double white dwarf population. So we were trying to indeed check if whether Magratia could form uh, um, around uh, the Lisa stars. And then uh, we did it for different temperatures, for instance, uh, because when the binaries, when the, when the, when the second when the second star is becoming a white dwarf, and then we will have a double white dwarf system, uh, of course, uh, if you start formations right at the beginning, it will be a higher temperature. In this case, for this system, it was 75,000 uh, um, K. Or if you wait for uh, the, the, the formation to, to start, so I don't know, one mega year after, the, the star, of course, is going to be cooler because it's a white dwarf, so, so it's just like losing temperature, losing radiation, so it will be 32,000 Kelvin. Okay, so we studied it, the formation as a function of uh, when it was starting after um, the double white dwarfs became a double white dwarf. Um, and indeed, the temperature and the disk size are very important. So here you have uh, that uh, we had a very teeny tiny um, disk, so 50 AU. The Smallest is your disk, the smaller are the planets that you're building, right? And all of them, they were growing, growing until like until 10 to the, 10 to the second um, Earth masses. Um, and the same here, more or less, you have uh, also for 50 AU. Um, the, the temperature, of course, here is affecting the condensation line. So in here, when it's cooler, of course, you have more space to, to probe, to have dust and accrete on dust. Here you have less material to accrete because the region of dust is smaller, of pebble accretion, right? Um, and this is the case of formation of a giant, but I'm gonna, here you can see it here. So basically, uh, the difference is that here you can see that it's starting like in this system, uh, the, um, all of the different seeds, so every line is one seed that is starting as this thing, at this uh, separation, then it's going up and, and growing uh, uh, as a function of the, well, you, you, along the curves. All of this shape here is basically runaway gas, gas accretion. For such, the, um, the planet is becoming giant. And in, in this system, 32,000 Kelvin, like most of the planets became giants, most of the seeds became giants. But in here, only few of them, because others, uh, they are just like not starting runaway gas accretion, so they just uh, stay um, small rocky planets and all of these are increasing it. But this is like just because of the size, the metallicity of the disk, and the, and the temperature. Right, so just uh, uh, almost finished. 
we studied three different size, three different starting time of formation, so zero mega year, so highest temperature, 0 0.1 mega year, 40 to 45, blah, blah, and one mega year where it was cooler. And we saw that always we can find, you can form a terrestrial planet. Uh, giant formation, of course, is a bit more tricky because you need to accrete more mass. Um, and uh, if we start with lunar mass seeds, then we can accrete a giant formation starting at time zero. And if we start at time 0 0.1, we'll need to have a first generation super Earth or mini Neptune to create a Magratia. Okay, um, this is really the, the final slide. Of course, you have a formation of new planets. Many planets can form in the same disk, but at some point like, you need to check whether it's stable or not, the configuration is stable, because uh, these planets will indeed, uh, or, or planets, or yeah, the tiny thing that are forming, um, they will indeed uh, interact with them themselves um, and can cause planet-planet uh, planet scattering. There will be like a, an epoch of assessment trying to, to find the, 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 the equilibrium and uh, a stable planetary system. So um, we did, um, we took the results of the previous work that you saw, like so we knew more or less the range of masses that were forming within a disk. We took the same planetary, the binaries of the, the LISA binaries, and then we simulated so many, so many systems, like uh, for every, um, every double white dwarf, we simulated uh, 100, uh, 100 uh, systems, and we, we checked what was happening by the end of it. Um, what we found is that uh, most of the multiplanetary system has like four or three, um, that had four or three planets at the beginning. There was um, chaos and they were losing a planet and they were remaining with two planets. The one with two planets basically never happened, no nothing happened, it was a very quiet evolution. Um, so in the end, basically, the peak of the distribution is around, uh, at the end of the simulation, we have uh, an increase of 23% 20, more of uh, um, system with just two planets. And here, I just included like an example of, uh, these are all like a set of, uh, of planets, so plan system number 31, 32, 33. So each line is one different, uh, one system. The original separation is given, um, is given by the, the green dots in here. And then uh, the final configuration is given by the full dots. So you see that, like, for example, here, these three, this three planets, there was a fourth one, because sometimes there is an overlap. It has many more planets before, and then they just uh, finished with three planets and so on. Um, so yeah, that was just to show you how you analyze uh, um, all of the different planets to understand whether there was a massive change in the, in the orbits and the, in the um, number of, uh, of planets and so on. Uh, and that was it. So um, take home messages from all the lectures that we, we went through. I tried to do like, um, trying I know that it's very different topics, the, the things that we, we checked. But, um, and that's why, like, I, at the beginning, I always said that like, interdisciplinary um, um, project, because uh, you have planetary people, you have uh, double weight dwarf people, and then you have planetary formation people. So it's quite tricky. Okay, starting from the very first class, uh, we have the compact binary evolution is very different from, uh, uh, from single, binary, single, single star evolution because of course it's like two bodies and that they are interacting with each other. Um, the common envelope phase, so when uh, in the moment that you have uh, an unstable mass transfer, it's uh, very complicated and uh, it's still not yet well understood, but there are two different formalisms to try to explain it now. Mm, we have uh, different planetary architectures. One of that is uh, the P-type uh, architecture, which is uh, a circumbinary case where you have one planet that is orbiting two stars, two, two, two close uh, stars. And um, we cannot find many of them because uh, of observational biases. Um, 
yet we know that the occurrence rate out there is uh, either the same or higher than the single star configuration. We know that planets can evolve uh, uh, beyond the main sequence. We have observational evidence and it's supported by theory. Um, and circumbinary planets have more chances to survive the evolution exactly because the, the evolution of the binary is more compact, let's say, and it's the easiest way to say, than compared to the single star um, case. Um, LISA has the potential to detect giant exoplanets, but just in the case of the period of the exoplanet to be less the, the, than the observing period of, uh, of LISA. Um, and then we, we just saw today that uh, second generation or third, whatever, um, can indeed happen in the disk under a theoretical point of view. And we are starting seeing evidence that this, uh, um, this can be indeed the case for, uh, uh, even for observational, uh, well, for the more empirical part of the, of the work. Mm. And that's it. Do you have any questions? Run, run. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Uh, what do we know about the habitability of uh, uh, exoplanets that are orbiting circumbinary planets? I mean, uh, we know that exoplanets can survive beyond the main sequence, but uh, do we know something about the radiation or the atmosphere of these planets? No. But, no, it's fine. It's not the, um, right, okay. Uh, yes and no. Let me start with the cool part. Um, what is really interesting about a planet that is orbiting a white dwarf, can be a white dwarf or a double white dwarf, is that it's a star that is like a cooling down. So, you know that the, um, the habitable zone is a function of uh, how much radiation you have from uh, from from your star, so it's the region where technically you should, you can support uh, liquid water. Um, that's the simple definition. Now they are building up so many definitions of habitable zone that I'm going literally crazy trying to follow all of them. Uh, but let's just stick with that. So if you have a very hot star, obviously your um, habitable zone is going to be far away. But then the star is cooling down, right? So your habitable zone is going is to, as, as, as long as this one is cooling down, it's going to get closer to the star. So um, this was one of the reasons why people started looking at planets around, double white, uh, around white, single white dwarfs, is because uh, indeed uh, um, you have higher chances to find them like uh, in the transiting, which means that they have to be close to the star and in the habitable zone. Because at the moment, now we are observing around main sequence stars and they are very close in, but the habitable zone is so far away. Mm -hmm. But if we have like a right temperature of, of a white dwarf, you can observe the transit. If it's a transit, you can observe it like uh, ideally through spectroscopy. Yeah, okay. Um, not, not completely correct, but I co I'll, I'll explain why. And then it can be also in the habitable zone. So it's uh, one gold mine uh, for some of us. Uh, when I'm saying that it's not completely correct, it's because uh, we study the atmosphere of an exoplanet through an indirect way. So we, we need to have the light of the star that is passing through the atmosphere of the planet to observe what's, uh, what are the molecules in the atmosphere of the planet that are, are blocking us the view of the star. But a white dwarf is very tiny. So in the moment you have a transit, it's possibly occulting the, the, the full star. So what you will have to do is to observe it like in uh, spectrophotometry, possibly, in the moment that it's covering the star. But 
the star is also, it's like the transit is very quick. So you might not have enough time to build your signal to noise. So this is under development. More questions? I have one about the Elise emission. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people expect to see a lot of stuff, and they would like to see how uh, can we see all the stuff that we expect. I mean, because you want to choose Lisa to to look for uh, astrophysical stuff and uh, stuff related to that. Some of people wants to look for primordial uh, gravitational waves. Some people wants to look to black holes merging. And how how it will work? I mean. You spend that time looking at specific stuff, and another time looking at specific stuff, or mm -hmm. everything at the same time. Um, the concept is everything at the same time because you turn on the microphone and you get all of your signals. Um, of course, uh, if I have to be sure that that's an exoplanet, for instance, I will have to keep uh, listening for. Uh, to, to, the, to the data for a longer time than the people that need to just have uh, mm, one quick signal uh, that is very clear. Um, so everyone will start at the same time, but some other people will need more time to do, to do things. On a political level, what's happening is like uh, there is a period of, uh, there will be a first data release by the consortium for specific stuff. So it's a large consortium, and what we are doing now is uh, uh, trying to indeed organize the way to build uh, packages of, uh, of, uh, of teams that will want to do specific stuff so that everyone is aware of uh, what everyone wants to do. Um, and then at that point, like, the data will be available for everyone to do their own science. Of course, if you publish uh, in the in the proprietary period, you will have to publish with the whole consortium um, because that's the way it works. Um, it's not going to be easy because, of course, like uh, for example, the exoplanetary case is uh, it, it's it's a tiny thing, you know. Like uh, most of the of, of the mission is focused on other things. And I fully understand. I mean, it was built for a completely different reason. Like uh, the, the fact that we have a new science case for exoplanet is just like uh, wow, mind blowing. But in what I'm trying to do parallel is uh, trying to build in the in the pipeline already a way to identify whether there is a third body or not. And so Michael Katz, that I mentioned, he's one of those that is developing the global fit, and uh, he's working indeed with us to to try to make sure that this is happening. Uh, it will be, yeah, that's it. Okay, so we thank Camila for this beautiful set of lectures. <laughs> we can reconvene in 20 minutes. <laughs>